to start? Okay. Yes, please. Hello. Yep. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Design Incubations, Designing Your Research Agenda. This is our second session in this ongoing series. Um, so hopefully we'll have another one coming up this spring. Um, Design Incubation has a lot of exciting events coming up uh, that Jessica and I are going to briefly talk about uh, so that we can really save the uh, majority of this time for our panelists to speak about their work. Um, coming up on uh, November 12th, we're going to be doing our uh, mapping uh, research uh, with the AIGA DEC. That is on November 12th at 3 Eastern time. So you can find on, on the AIGA DEC um, website. And we're definitely looking for collaborators to help us continue to map uh, research and scholarship and what that looks like. That will also be an ongoing initiative. Uh, we also wanted to remind you about the Design Incubation Awards uh, that are coming up. So you can self-nominate or you can nominate someone else. Um, so that uh, deadline is in December. You can also find out more about that on our website. Um, and I'm going to turn the rest of it over to Jess. Okay. Um, we have a couple things, uh, other things happening this spring. We do have a, set, a colloquium session at the CAA's annual conference. Uh, the spring and we're also going to be continuing our mapping of um, communication design research and scholarship as part of our annual meeting at CAA. So those are two things to keep an eye on for the schedule to come out from CAA directly. Um, and I think just to add a little more about this session, um, as many of you know, because you're here, uh, part of our journey is to sort of carve out our narratives and that can be a challenge depending on the type of institution we're at. Uh, where, where we enter academia from, whether it's from industry or somewhere else, um, lots of different pain points and, and so on. And so we've started to put this together to collectively help each other and hear other people's journeys. Um, so as we sort of carry uh, these group of panelists, uh, we are being very mindful of bringing forth diverse voices and people working at different kinds of institutions and on different kinds of projects. So that's really exciting. I think for all of us. Um, and we're also looking for more voices to bring forth um, at sessions going forward. So if you know of people um, maybe that are, are off our radar or that would be great to hear from as well, um, please feel free to email and um, including yourselves if you're interested in speaking at these events moving forward. So yeah. okay. Um, we started this uh, this project, designing your research agenda, last year, actually at last spring at CAA, and we found it was a great way to showcase um, different kinds of research agendas, different kinds of creative practice, coming from faculty at different kinds of institutions with various uh, backgrounds and experiences. And so, um, as we move forward with this project, yeah, as Heather mentioned, we do want to have you know a variety of voices present and. Um, give ideas, of course, to, of course, new faculty, um, graduate students, and people that are actively trying to figure out um, the direction for their scholarship. And also, right. like Dan said in the chat, so this is a webinar format, which is a little bit weird. <laughs> um, so we, but that allows us to highlight the panelists. And then at the end, when we're done, we'll kind of welcome everybody into the room so we can say, hi, we did that last time and it was a lot of fun, just sort of open the dialogue. So that will come later on and we'll be able to see everybody's faces. Um, but so now uh, I suppose we should begin. We should begin. Okay. So that means Tashika will take it away. Tashika. Okay. Oh. So You're it's up. on me, yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me uh, share. Oops, sorry. Hi, I'm Tashika Arsena Sutton, and I'm really happy to be here. So I just want to give just a little brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to necessarily focus um, too much on any um, individual project, but just mainly sort of talk about how I came about the research that I do and a little bit about my um, academic journey. So um, I uh, attended graduate school at CalArts for three years. And uh, in my second year, um, the faculty decided to do this new project to help us um, to come up with a thesis topic. And so the project was called Genealogy Project. 
And the brief stated to come up with 10 images that somehow directly or indirectly influenced your work. And so for me, that didn't make sense for me personally. And so um, I thought more about the experiences that I had that sort of influenced my work. So that's, you know, literature, um, document, uh, you know, movies, film, television series, um, art and design was in there, but I thought about the sort of stories that impacted my life, whether that was through um, literature. And the, the one thread that I found was, you know, it came to music, literature, film, television series, things like that, um, African-American history and culture and identity was strong but when it came to my genealogy with art and design there was nobody in that section that looked like me and there was only one woman and so to be honest I was really embarrassed by this uh, reality that um, I didn't know anything about black people um, in graphic design and some of this kind of hit me um, right before graduate school, actually at my first AIGA conference that I went to back in 2004, I believe it was in Vancouver. And I counted maybe like five of the black people there. I'm sure they had more than that, but that's all I saw. And the other reality that hit me is when I entered graduate school and um, my first year, I was the only black student in the graduate and undergraduate program. So then I began to sort of wonder and question why aren't there as many black people in, in graphic design. And so doing this research for the genealogy project, I started being curious about, you know, is there some kind of black aesthetic? Is there, you know, something that sort of ties, you know, um, black visual work together? And so I ran across this article, I mean, this essay written by uh, Sylvia Harris. And um, this was important and this is um, a good discovery for me because it, wasn't a blueprint, but at least it, it sort of gave you a place or somewhere to sort of look for um, those images. And so the essay is broken down into, you know, these um, by the decades and sort of important things that were happening in Black art, art and culture during this time that had visuals that were associated with it that you could sort of refer to. And so as a part of the, the genealogy project, we had to sort of figure out, okay, how do you you know, make something out of this research. And so since Santa Hawk was the one woman that I had a part of my design genealogy, I decided to create these two posts, uh, one poster that sort of existed as a front and back. And so on the front, it said, you know, kind of taking a jab at design history and saying, this is what African-American design history looks like, you know, images of white men and a few women. And then at the bottom, you know, what is Hannah, what if Hannah Hoff was an African-American and then you flip over the other side and then you see this on the poster. Um, and at this time, I started doing more research on sort of black artists, looking to the Harlem Renaissance. I ran across Romel Bearden, who did a lot of collage work uh, representing the sort of day-to-day -day life and work of black people in Harlem. And so that was sort of my inspiration, how I approached the, the other side of the poster. Still at this time, I wasn't discovering that many black people in design. Uh, so continuing in my research, uh, I did come across uh, this book called African Fractals by Ronnie Glass, um, Computing and Indigenous Design. I mean, in this book, fractals are characterized as repetitive, as repetitive patterns at diminishing scales. He showcases the fractal grids used by African communities, which are created more organically compared to those in Europe and North America. Uh, he made connections with fractals and textile, sculpture, painting, carving, symbolic symbols, traditional hairstyles. Um, when I ran across cornrows, which is a, a style that I used to wear my hair in, you know, growing up and braids. And so I was really fascinated and excited to find that there was some kind of graphical language that was connected to mathematics and how cornrows are um, and cornrow patterns. And so towards the end um, of the project, um, we were sort of tasked with, okay, so what do we do with this research? How do you package it? You know, what, you know, how do you, you know, sort of present it? And so, um, because you know history books at the time, uh, still now, didn't have a lot of information about black people. I thought it would be a good idea just to sort of design a book as a container for my research. And so that book was called A Primer of Black Graphic Designers. And um, what I did was I, you know, took each letter of the alphabet and had each spread represent a letter. And if there was 
a person that I found in my research whose last name was associated with that particular alphabet, then I displayed their work, um, a picture of them, some information, um, sort of biographical information. Then throughout there are like quotes and um, other essays um, and, and some stuff that I, I gathered during my research. But again, the thing that became as important as obviously the pages that occupied the space of the information were all the blank pages that existed throughout. And so when I graduated, I, you know, I actually thought I was going to continue to fill in those gaps, right, to fill up information on those blank pages. But um, right after graduation, I took a job as an in-house designer at CalArts. And for those three years, um, I didn't do much research at all. And so I decided or, um, or had a talk with a mentor or someone that maybe going to teach, I thought I was going to teach much later, maybe I should go and teach so I can re-engage in the research um, that I was interested in. And so I love CalArts and I got a tenure track position at Southeastern Louisiana University, which is a public institution, which means that some percentage or part of their budget is funded by the state. Uh, Southeastern is considered something like a, um, I guess a research two institution where they're more focused on teaching. So our time is sort of divided and split up where 50% of your time is for teaching, 40% for professional practice and research and 10% of uh, services to the university. Um, it took me probably two years, not until like 2013 before I actually got adjusted and was able to sort of re-engage with the research that I had kind of started back in um, when I was in undergraduate school. And there wasn't a whole lot of support at Southeastern to do this because our teaching load is like a 3-3. There are moments where I taught, you know, 4-3, just depending on the year and what was required. Um, and the most support that you got was, you know, you can you know, apply for a travel grant and go to a conference and have, you know, you travel in your hotel room and the conference fees paid for, but there wasn't a whole lot of infrastructure to help with research. Um, there was um, a grant that you can apply for called the, um, uh, uh, an enhancement grant where you can get up to $700 to help go towards research and creative activity and to enhance your teaching. And so around uh, 2013, when I did started trying to re-engage in my research again, I started working, um, uh, became part of the faculty at Vermont College of Fine Arts, which at the time was really good for me because um, it's a low residency program and twice a year we go on campus and each residency, the faculty is required to either do a lecture about their research um, host a workshop or some kind of panel or something. And so this was really good for me because it gave me like these checkpoints to sort of um, have, you know, a, a reason to like, you know, engage with my research. And it just started to become a habit for me. And so this past fall, um, I just became a, a tenure professor. Well, I got tenured actually when I was at Southeastern. Um, and actually I acquired tenure at Southeastern through my creative work and um, by exhibiting work at exhibitions abroad and having my work published in publications and things like that. And so after I got tenure back in um, 2017 at Southeastern, I decided that I wanted my, I wanted to sort of shift, make a shift in my work in, in my practice where um, writing and publishing became more a part of, of the work that I did. And so um, I, I, it's hard for me to really say how I'm supported by NC State as far as like my research, um, just because I'm so new. Um, there is a huge sort of staff of, of people that are there for you to sort of talk to them about your research and, and they can sort of notify you about things that are there that are out there like grants and stuff for you to apply to. Um, because, you know, where NC State is located physically, I have access to the triad so I can do research, you know, at multiple um, university. So there is a resource there. My teaching load is so much better than it was at Southeast. And so I definitely have more time to sort of focus on um, writing and being published and things of that nature, which I do have several projects um, in the workings um, in regards to that. 
Um, my research in general falls in a category of graphic design history, and I'm interested in discovering people who basically have sort of been left out the, the graphic design canon. And it started with asking questions like, where are the Black graphic designers? Is there such a thing as a Black graphic design aesthetic? Where are the Black graphic designers in design history? Is there a lack of knowledge and representation of Black people in graphic design history? Um, is that the reason for the lack of Black people in this profession? And then here is just sort of a list of areas that I started focusing on. Um, a way that I've been able to sort of kind of, um, I guess, kind of carve out uh, a way to enhance my research and my practice is basically sharing my research. So doing panels and having lectures and discussions like this one, but also collaboration, you know, sort of talking to people and engaging with other people who have similar um, research um, interests as I do. And so that's what led to projects like the BIPOC um, Black History of Design course um, that I did with Silas Moreau and Pierre Boynes. Um, those kind of things led to other um, writing projects that are haven't come to fruition yet, but things that are um, kind of in the works right now. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Tashika. Thank you, Tashika. So we will have time for Q&A at the end of everything. So we're going to move um, on to our next panelist, uh, Liat, you're up. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. That was so great to hear your work, Tashika. I, I love getting to see it. Um, okay, I'm gonna share and play. Let me just pull out my notes. Okay, so hi, everyone. My name is Liat Verdugo. I am a new media artist and also the director of the design program and associate professor at the University of San Francisco. Um, today, I'm gonna talk to you about my research, what it is, how I do it, and how I came to it. I've been asked to talk for only 10 minutes, so this is going to be very brief. So the first thing I want you to know is I'm not exactly a designer. I'm one of those new media artists that was hired into a design program to teach designers how to code and to think about design for the internet. My work involves performance like this piece, Internet Aerobics, a 20 minute aerobics routine about the internet streaming to you through the internet, which uses props of long blue ethernet cables. My work often involves coding. This was a piece commissioned for the Center for Contemporary Art in Tel Aviv. Um, visitors to the gallery space were, could only access Wi-Fi by shaking their smartphones vigorously. So they weren't allowed to get on the Wi-Fi without doing that. And it sort of asked the question of what are our bodies willing to do for technology? Okay, um, my work involves landscape and land art like this project Encoded Forest, which encoded a Wi-Fi password in binary in a field in Mendocino, California. We graded the field and instead of using ones and zeros for binary, we used tree and no tree. We planted hundreds of redwood trees and future Wi-Fi seekers were instructed to walk along the forest to decode the password among the trees. My work involves a lot of video, especially when I work in my two-person art collective, Anxious to Make. We make work about economic concepts and specifically the sharing economy and more recently crypto. And I also curate and gather communities together. I started a media art salon series in the Bay Area called the Living Room Light Exchange, which used to meet in rotating living rooms um, and host three speakers a month before the pandemic and has now shifted online. So what all this means is that my research is constituted of both my creative production and my writing. I, I currently direct a design program, which is inside a department of art and architecture, inside a college of arts and sciences, inside a liberal arts university. And I think that is all um, really really matters to my own agenda. 
This is how I organized my research file when I went up for tenure. So this is just the overview of it. Um, I chose to put it in different areas thematically. So the first area was uh, my work around visual studies approach to politics, conflict, and militarization, et cetera, et cetera. And then within each of those areas, it includes, included published writing and then also creative work. Um, and those were exhibitions and, and projects that I had in the public sphere. And I, um, this is an example of how I would document creative work. So for each one, I would have the title, the year, a description, images, um, press clippings, et cetera, about it. Um, and the people who reviewed and judged my research at my institution are not artists or designers. So that means from the academic part of my career, I have to make my work legible to a lot of different kinds of people. So chemists, psychology professors, and these are people who are much more familiar with counting publications as research than counting art as research. And so writing has become a big part of my research agenda. Um, it has also been part of my artistic practice for a really long time, even before I went into academia. So in college, I actually majored in mathematics, but I wrote my thesis in literary arts through a loophole. And this is um, my thesis from college, which was published by a small poetry press. And inside of it are um, diagrams that I studied from my mathematics degree, each one kind of poetically reinterpreted to imagine what a novice might see in these diagrams versus what a mathematician sees in them. I was a de design incubation fellow in 2018 in the books track. Um, I had written a few articles on the same topic and I thought, sure, why not learn to write a book proposal? Um, that fellowship is now called the Design Writing Fellowship and is separate from Design Incubation. And the book proposal that I wrote back in 2018 is now out there in the world as a real book. It came out this January and it's about the effort to secure political justice by the use of citizen videography meaning everyday people using cell phones and video cameras against the authorities, and specifically about that in Israel-Palestine, which is a place that I have um, familial ties, citizenship, and lived when I was younger. And I just want to say how this project started. So it really started as an art fellowship that I was on in Israel-Palestine that led to video archives research. From that, I made performance, video art, sculpture, and a performative lecture. That lecture led to a literary journal publication, which then led to a conference talk, and then to um, a public scholarship essay, and then to the book proposal. So I just say this to say that um, it really was a passion project and had a very meandering form. I think it's very alluring to think that book projects always started as if they were books. In my experience in the design and art sector, that's rarely true. They often start as something else first. Um, here's a screenshot of what I actually made as my book pitch from Design Incubation, my book proposal. And uh, right after I, I made that proposal, this is my timeline of like how the book went. Okay, so just to be like totally transparent of all this. So in January of 2018, I went to the fellowship. They taught me that you can actually pitch editors at CAA. So I did that right away, um, which I think was good for me not to have too much time. So I, I didn't end up overthinking the process. Um, I had previously thought that all of the people who staff the book fair at CAA are cashiers and was delighted to know that they actually are acquisition editors who want to hear your book ideas. Um, and I got committed interest from two publishers right after that. And I was able to negotiate a fourth year sabbatical at my institution for this book as a result of that. And I say that because I don't think that's something my institution would have supported for an artistic work. It was really because it was a book that I was able to get that institutional support. I think that's one way that um, my research agenda has in part been shaped by the institution I work. I wanna show you a little bit about how I write. I do it physically a lot. So I pin up my book outline to studio walls. I pin up my important historical references and key images that I'm using and analyzing. 
I also edit my writing very physically. So when I revise, I print out my a whole chapter, I cut it up and I rearrange it with tape and scissors. And then I go back and write into it. So you can see that yellow paper that I'm adding, that's me rewriting into the drafts that I'm rearranging and editing. And then I also trash a lot of my writing. So I threw away 20% of the writing that I made for my book, one fifth of it. That's a lot. Um, and I also think that's pretty low. Like I just really believe that um, the writing process produces a lot of success and that in editing, I, I end up trimming that down. Um, I'm gonna do a shameless plug. If you wanna order my book, here's a discount code. Um, please ask your library to buy it because the sooner that the hard copies sell out for $100 a pop, which is insane, but the academic cost, the paperbacks will come out for the normal price of $30 each. So please ask your institution to buy it. Here's what it looks like on the inside. And I would say in terms of defining my research agenda, I generally believe in passion projects. Um, by this, I mean that I follow my own interests and then make them legible to academia later. I believe in being interested and engaged in the world around me and trusting that my work will come from that place. Um, I go on a lot, a lot of artist residencies to help me find the time. And when I do write, I almost always pitch places first, meaning I don't write an essay or an article without first knowing where it's going to be published. Or at this point, places reach out to me. Um, here's what pitch letter looks like to a public scholarship journal. And here's what a pitch letter looks like to a, um, a special topics academic journal. I'm gonna leave you with this picture of my four month old son reading my book when it came out. Um, my research tra trajectory has definitely changed since becoming a parent. And maybe that's something we or other folks will wanna talk about in the Q and A. And thank you, I hope I've kept within my time. Thank you so much, Liat. Thank you for sharing you so, much. so much of your process of writing. Okay, Q and A is coming up later, but um, <laughs> thank you. All right, and our um, final panelist, we have Casper. Well, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen too. All right, so I'm going to focus um, a little bit of my talk. I mean, both <laughs> of the talks are so wonderful. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, when I read the prompt, um, I focused a little bit more on sort of the ideas and the uh, the the entire kind of impetus of why I do um, what I do in terms of design research and designing. Um, and I actually wanted to start with a story. Um, and I think many of you know this story about Ariadne's thread. Uh, so Ariadne is actually um, a Greek princess who gave a ball of twine to Theseus to help him escape the labyrinth. Um, I think many of you know that he actually goes in, kills the, uh, kills the, the Minotaur and emerges victorious, but uh, he's actually not very nice of a guy. Um, so the good news of the story is that actually in, the, in this type of mythology, Ariadne's thread has come to symbolize trying to solve an intractable problem by going through and looking at every facet of the problem of trying all these different means. Uh, and so I think to talk a little bit about my research, uh, it actually begins in a science lab. So I was actually a biology major uh, and I worked as uh, basically a genetics researcher during my undergrad, um, doing something completely different. Um, and one of the questions that I really had early on was, uh, what is morphology, which is a scientific way of saying sort of what is what is form, what uh, you know, why do fish have eyes, why do giraffes have long necks, you know, why do we have limbs? That's this type of thing, and trying to see sort of how do these things come to be. Um, and so, in a typical scientific setting, you would, uh, in a biological setting, you would basically try to find a gene, turn it off, and then see what happens. Uh, what scientists would call uh, morphological knockdown experiments. And so this is actually what I spent most of my time doing very early on as, as trying to understand what, what scientific research was, right? Sequencing genes, performing experiments. Um, and it quickly turned out that I was actually more interested in this idea of text and image. 
um, and the relationship between the two, um, between text and image. And if we were to look at it in a sideways way, uh, really about ideas and form. Uh, and so the real question I was actually asking and the one that has uh, sort of driven me as a designer is, well, what is form and how does it come to be? So another kind of permutation of that um, idea. Uh, and of course, I think all of you know, I think you all laugh at me because it took me a long time to figure out that this is a design question and not a science one, at least in the way that I was uh, looking at it. Uh, and so the, the trajectory of my career so far has been to really ask this question again and actually ask it again and again as a series of questions with different collaborators. Um, so for instance, these, these questions might be, how do we translate ideas into form? How do we translate an evolved visual form of language? How do we describe our world of a shared language? And how do we build shared experiences? And so you can see that there's some similar threads that are running through it about language and form and evolution. Um, one thing that I, I think is a, is a barrier to all designers is that we actually have to create our own conditions, our own habitats to thrive. Um, this is something that uh, very early on when I was in grad school, we were really all kind of um, really, really vexed about, I would have to say, and it still vexes me, I have to say. Uh, I don't know if anybody feels the same way. Um, and so in order to tackle this, um, I actually work with a design partner, Eugene Park, and we have an office called Synoptic uh, Office or Design Studio. And the way that we work is actually cyclical in manner. And this has been to support the research that we do, but also the work that we want to do. So we operate as a design consultancy. Uh, we also do our own research initiatives and we also teach and publish things. And to us, there's no difference in the way that we do things. It, it just kind of spins around together uh, in our studio. Um, and the primary thing that kind of binds it at the core is this idea of learning through making. Uh, which defines how I would say I approach design research. Um, one of the things that we have found in making things is this idea of scale and complexity and how it affects productions and design systems and aesthetic form, uh, which I, I find to be really, really fascinating. And it's become even more fascinating when we think about how design has expanded from say graphic design to um, UI, UX to systems designers and all these kind of permutations of what design is. Uh, and that is, of course, because the more elements there are in a set, the the sort of the the more uh, things there are, right? Uh, the the amount of variation uh, and or the ease of it actually goes down dramatically. Um, and this actually begins to intersect with a lot of the work that we do. We work a lot with museums, cultural institutions, uh, archives, and things um, on on collections, network systems. Um, so it, it means that, you know, we might be creating um, sort of gamified platforms to collect metadata for artworks that don't have any data uh, attributed to it. Um, this is a, a, a basically a, game, a gamified system where people can enter um, information and then they level up from <laughs> at these different kind of levels. Um, it might also mean visualizing data. So last year we were uh, doing this in a pandemic. Uh, we were invited for a design festival in Hong Kong where we basically visualized headline news around the world to try to see sort of what people were thinking and feeling. Um, uh, and so this was built as a kind of a, uh, immersive table um, showing, showing up the fair. Um, it also might mean actually working a lot with archives, which is of endless fascination to me as a, as a personal thing. Um, one of the things that we got sucked into was uh, we discovered these Renaissance books. And, you know, during the Renaissance, of course, there's a rediscovery of perspective. Uh, but what was really fascinating about it was how perspective was rendered through faux architecture or architecture follies. And so we decided to put those architectural follies back into space to see how they would look. Um, and so we, we made this installation that opened in parallel with the Venice Biennale this year. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a life-size projection of these book, book titles, um, which the saddest part is we were not able to go because of the coronavirus. So all, all it exists is in photos and <laughs> in our imagination and videos that we ask people to take for us. Um, the, the, when working with these collections, what, what really interests us is the patterns and rules that emerge. Um, and that process of making with these collections gives us material knowledge of how aesthetics evolve. Uh, and so a particular interest that we have had um, has been to 
try to understand sort of other domains like, like Chinese typography um, and seeing how technology affects it. So for instance, um, the shift from sort of a calligraphic script to something that was printed. Uh, and you can see, I think, on a visual level, how things are, are quite different, right? When you write with the hand versus something that you, you literally stamp. Um, and so that actually began this rabbit hole that's still continuing of trying to understand this sort of first emergence of this typeface in the 11th to 17th century and beginning to create forms from it, to evolve it, to think about, well, what if this process of evolution uh, continued uh, and what, what permutations might occur to the typeface? Um, and so by making or sort of throwing ourselves into this, this making process, we were able to um, sort of write about our experiences, which um, our second edition of the book is actually on library stack that uh, you can check out. Uh, but it also has, um, but it also spawned other things like um, collecting typefaces and collecting different concepts and ideas around this, this domain, uh, which has actually served to be really useful in our consultancy practice um, where we, we use it to help us <laughs> do editorial design on the, on the globalized context. So in this case, uh, Bloomberg and some other projects that we've, we've done for different clients. Um, this cyclical approach allows us to weave together this larger understanding of what visual culture is and really what graphic design theory might be. Um, so if we were to think about uh, sort of type again and this idea of writing and typography and image, kind of expanding it or trying to connect it with um, these character-based notions that we find in Chinese um, and really trying to put together, you know, how are these relationships? How do they form? What similarities are there? What divergences there are? Um, because by doing that, um, you know, in my mind, it, it helps us unfold this larger idea of what graphic design can be, right? It's, it's idea, form and meaning, but as you begin to translate it to other contexts, it expands. And then also the, the back end of it, right? The contents, the metadata, and ultimately the ontology that supports it. Uh, and so graphic design is not simply the thing on the piece of paper, but it suddenly becomes really expansive and really interesting to me as a research topic. Um, and so going back to this idea of Ariane's thread, right? As you pull on these threads or we begin to ask questions uh, again and again, uh, I'm hoping maybe one day um, to actually find a way out of this labyrinth that I've, I don't know if I've created it myself or I've just decided to enter um, to really try to understand what this idea of form is and how it comes to be. So thank you. I will stop my screen share. Oh, thank you so much, Casper. Um, so we have a we have over 20 minutes for Q&A. <laughs> um, you were all so nicely respectful of time. Yes, thank you. <laughs> this is perfect. Um, my brain is so full of like inspiration right now. Um, it was so great to see these just diverse ways of working and just the way you're all approaching design research. It's just different ways. It's, um, it's, been, it's fascinating. Amazing. I don't know if Dan's there. Dan, do you want to uh, do QA via the chat or should we let everybody in? Um, either or, how, how would you like to do it? Oh, I can, I can start bringing people in. <laughs> Attendees, would any of you like to come into the space to chat or you can use the chat <laughs> window as an alternative? I'll, be, I'll, I'll just begin um, by bringing people in. Okay. When I, when okay. I, yeah, we see faces. <laughs> and then I guess if the panelists have questions or comments for each other too, we could start there. To make sure, oops. Does anyone have questions for our panelists that you'd like to put in the chat or if you wanna unmute your mics? Yeah, or just comments. I mean, I feel like for uh, for Jess and I anyway, who have been trying to think about this for a while, um, I feel like seeing these three bodies of work and research was exactly what we were hoping for. Um, just mm -hmm. like Jess said, seeing people work in really different ways across yeah. medium, everybody had a project that just sort of blew my mind. So I feel uh, I feel really happy to see that. And the, uh, you know, bits and pieces of people's paths like Tashika's, Liat's behind the scenes. Casper seeing the connections between practice and research was really amazing. So thank you for that. 
I also love how you, all three of you had different interpretations of our prompt, <laughs> the, the, the cryptic prompt that Heather and I emailed. And for those of you yeah, attending, um, the prompt were things like, how did you form your research agenda? And yeah. how does your institution play a role? Or, you know, how did you, you know, decide the, how do you identify with different kinds of design, whether it's history or practice or um, scholarship and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, this is great. We do have one question. Well, one question from Aggie Toppins who says she has a bunch of questions, but we have one. Um, Aggie, do you want to come into the space and ask this? Or I don't see her yet. No, not yet. Okay. She says, I've noticed a bit of a, um, a chasm in the. Oh, Aggie, you're there. <laughs> I okay. Think I'm in now. Can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, oh, okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for these presentations. They were all three so amazing. Um, my, my first question is, um, I, I've noticed a bit of a, a chasm in the field, uh, in the academic side of our field between sort of the studio based service industry side of things, which might be, you know, best uh, represented by AIGA, for example, and the kind of scholarly expectations of academic publications like visible language or design issues, design and culture, which tend to be edited by PhD bearing designers often outside of the United States. I'm just wondering how the panelists um, might respond to the question, how do you grow your capacity for scholarly rigor? And um, how do you get feedback of this nature on your work? Yeah, that's a great question. I feel I it. When you when you ask um, grow your capacity for scholarly rigor, do you mean like, how do you make your work legible to places like design and culture? I mean, that's one way of answering it, Liat. I'm also thinking just like about how, and maybe this is my own um, background coming into the question is I've only studied graphic design. Like I don't have any experience in other fields, but it's not a field that uh, like, especially at the MFA level necessarily trains you for that kind of rigor. It's more like, mm. it's more like studio and professional service industry practice, at least, at least um, that's common. So you can answer however you want, but I guess I was kind of um, thinking of it that way. So is it more about the transition? Uh, maybe to get a better understanding, like how do you go from um, doing sort of more creative type of work to maybe more academic, more scholarly writing? Is that what you're? Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of ways to answer it. Yeah, or like moving from a studio-based, practice-based education toward publishing written work. Yeah. Um, I know for me personally, um, it kind of started where I made a conscious decision to do so. So you got I mentioned in my presentation, um, and this is something that was pointed out to me in my interview at NC State, I didn't even realize it, was the department head said, oh, you, you got tenure through your, um, your studio practice and your creative work. And I said, I did. I didn't realize that. Like, I, I didn't even... Um, realizing it until he actually said it, um, which was interesting because after, after that process, I made a conscious decision that I didn't know what to do in my research, to be honest. That's sort of how I look at it. And so um, doing talks and doing lectures didn't seem like um, enough. Like it seemed like something more tangible needs to come out of the set of work that I was doing, especially since since my focus is on um, black design history, there isn't anything tangible that's sort of out there that, um, that has that information. And so I made a point to say, hey, I wanna start writing more. I want to start um, publishing and getting my work out there. I wanna start collaborating with other people who are doing similar projects. So for me, that's sort of how it started. And um, like Liad, I actually, this past, um, summer I did the design incubation writing fellowship as well which part of it was I did the um uh not the book but the review <laughs> I did the book review part because that was a, a form of writing that I was not accustomed to so I would just say that um just kind of just jump in there right I mean I, I had no clue about how to go about writing a review for anything um and I purposely didn't choose the exhibition 
direction just because I felt too easy. Like I can easily look at a body of creative work and sort of make an assessment or critique of it, but to sort of critique somebody else's writing was um, was a new. And so I would say that once I sort of made a conscious decision to transition my practice slightly, I mean, I still enjoy doing creative projects and I still, you know, do creative projects in my um, in my studio, but somehow you sort of open that up, you let other people know, and then they know that you're interested in certain things. And so those projects, you know, start to kind of flow your way or you start to, to know about them. Um, and as far as like getting feedback, um, I found that the writing process, you get feedback from the editors or whoever you're trying to get your work from. Um, people seem to be a little bit more, I don't, and I'm new at this, I will admit, um, it seemed like in the past people were less willing to give you feedback, even if your work wasn't accepted for publishing, but now it seems like a lot of publishers are willing to sort of give you feedback and tell you what's sort of working and what's not. And peers, you know, faculty at my institution are always saying, hey, I can read something if you want, you can run it by me. Yeah, that's yeah. great. I, yeah. I would add to that. Um, I really understand what you're asking, Aggie. Um, I think there is a really big chasm. Um, I wish I could give you a better answer. I think for me, it has always felt like these forms are really um, interwoven. Like I said, writing's been a part of my practice for a really long time. I will say that I, um, I'm a really big believer in public scholarship writing, so not just academic writing. Some of the work that I've done that's had the most readership and the most impact and people want to talk about with me the most has been published in, published in places like Places Journal or um, the Architectural Review, which is a public scholarship journal, which means that it's not pay gated. Um, so I've always found that that writing is sometimes a little more accessible. Um, and has a little bit of a bigger audience. So I've really liked doing that in my career. Yeah, I, I have to say, um, I, I, I have, I, I definitely, you know, have um, questions about this myself, to be quite honest. Um, and I think Tashika's answer about just sort of going on and then just, just trying it um, has been maybe the experience that I've, I've encountered. Um, I, I do have to say that that the this chasm, if you want to call it that, or even even this idea of design research, like what is it, um, and the entire idea of how we are supposed to structure it or approach it is still something of an open question for me. I don't I don't really have an answer to that, um, and the reason being is, um, you you know I. And I'll say this sort of given, you know, because I was trained in this kind of scientific research, I can see that design is extremely different. And it makes me a little nervous um, it, when, you know, I see, you know, some designers saying, okay, we, we need to be more like the sciences or, you know, I'm just, I'm just making some examples up, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That really does make me nervous because I think that if you're going to do that, then we will always be in a disadvantage. Um, and that's, that's there, there's something there that, uh, I don't perjure myself by saying this. It's, it's a little, it's a little, it's a little weird. Um, it's a little weird on all fronts, meaning I don't have a, I don't have quite a clear answer for that, but it, it just, it, it feels a little different. It's, it's a very different type of practice. Um, and so um, the reason why, um, I, I guess, you know, especially at the institution I teach at Parsons uh, and, and the way that I've structured the practice is because I really do firmly believe in that material-based research, um, you know, because, you know, I, I received an MFA. And so that is, I would say that, you know, if I know anything, that is the thing that I know. Uh, I'm not a historian. Um, and so it, it does, it does leave, it does leave designers with a lot of deficiencies, right? Like if we were to do go and do historical research, um, which which we do do uh, for our type projects, uh, we're trying to do that type of research, um, but it's actually very difficult because we have not been trained in it. You know, we're kind of figuring it out as we go along, uh, and that's just kind of the, the fact of the matter. Um, 
And there's always this open question of, well, are we doing it correctly? What is the methods that we're supposed to adopt? Uh, is this even, is this even, you know, the right, you know, process or or even the right way to think about it? And I'm um, on all sides, both on the AIG side, on on the re design research side, it's it's all it, it's all very muddy. And I'm I'm actually glad that we're having this kind of discussion because I'm I I'm not sure where we are supposed to end up. Um, for a very long time, I would say that I thought that design research was design criticism. Um, design research, maybe even meaning like design historical research, like that would be something that, that could kind of exist. But design criticism, uh, one of the things that I've, I've kind of seen is that it's kind of petered off a little bit or it, it seemed it was going strong for a while and then it, it fizzled and then maybe it's coming back or, um, and there's also kind of a, a question mark around it. So. Um, you know, where does that fit in? Because in, in some ways it seems very natural to have design criticism because, you know, you have art art history and art criticism, like it, it would seem to make for natural bedfellows, but uh, but then there is this design research. And so then what is that? What is that? So I don't know. I think I answered that with a lot of questions and just kind of circular <laughs> talking, but uh, I, I mean, I, I think that kind of shows you, I, I, really, I really don't have an answer other than I do believe that what, I think many of us actually received an MFA and that I do think that that part is really valuable and how do we activate that? Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like everything you were saying, Casper, are things I've in particular been talking to Dan about offline <laughs> uh, because I'm in an institution with a lot of PhDs and I got my MFA quite late in life. And so I always like to dip my toes in things so I can gain respect and kind of understand if it's a dissemination channel for me. But I got a little lost in feeling like I had to be down this research path when actually my things I bring to the table are maybe not necessarily best suited there. Uh, but I also have a real fear as design gets co-opted by tech and big tech conferences or research that we lose the beauty and the creative freedom that comes to us as artists. And so especially in a time when we're encouraged to break systems and structures and rethink everything that exists, I definitely don't want to be stuck in a box. Um, and so I think about everything you just said quite a lot. <laughs> so I appreciate yeah, that. I don't have an answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a very vexing question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Design research is kind of, be, kind of become, I say become, because I think it's still, the idea of that is still forming. It's going to become something that doesn't exist in other disciplines. It's just a, its own kind of thing. Yeah. And I think this relates to a um, question that um, Omar posted in the chat. And I see, Omar, you're in the space. If you'd <laughs> like to ask it yourself. Um, but it relates to Aggies. Um, how okay. do you choose? Oh, oh sorry. I Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I guess like Casper like, addressed like a uh, many interesting points, right? What, what is design research anyway? Because we're seeing... Um, historical research, but also we can consider design criticism or should we do something more experimental like in science or practice-based? And that was why in my mind, it's like, what am I supposed to do as a researcher, right? Because I cannot do everything, but um, I'm fascinated by what I'm seeing. And I like, thank you, the three of you for your presentations. Um, but yeah, I guess my question was to do about, hey, if you're doing historical or, um, you know, archive-based, do you have a framework? Um, how do you choose your methods? How do you guarantee or validate that your um, outcome is, you know, advancing knowledge in that particular, or I was even thinking like, how do you um, connect your work with your teaching or stuff like that? But yeah, that's basically what I was trying to ask on the chat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it would happen, I'd be the one muted. Um, do any of you have a, uh, any kind of like um, identifiable framework that you follow or even a framework that you've developed for yourself to follow as you move through? I know Casper, your presentation showed quite a few of your kind of ways you were thinking. Um, you know, Tashika, you're doing historical research and Liat, you know, you're doing very like, it's creative, creative practice based in writing, but um, how often do you identify like a, a research framework or theory. Yeah, I um I really borrow a lot from um, visual culture and visual studies frameworks, um, mm -hmm. and those are frameworks that um, very much welcome in 
uh, many, many different visual materials, all, all to welcome analysis of anything visual. So I draw from film. Um, I even draw from like literature and writing. Clearly, I'm really inspired by the kinds of images that people out there in the world are making with their own cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really find I draw a lot from visual studies. Um, I know Omar, we've talked so much about your research, so I know you're in a, a different um, area with, with user research as well. And oftentimes I find like um, looking at journals that you wanna read or that you want your work published in and trying to understand um, where, what kinds of meth like methodology those, those writers are using is a great way to identify a kind of framework for for pitching your work. And it's great to see you, Omar. I think we may have a couple more questions in here. Um, here's a question for Tashika from Aggie. <laughs> <laughs> what are some differences in tenure promotion expectations from Southeastern and North, uh, NC State? Are you permitted to claim graphic design history in your purview without a PhD in this field? Um, to my knowledge, yes, but to my knowledge, no. <laughs> um, and so that's a, that's a good question because it's actually something that I've been kind of um, thinking a lot about lately, especially being at a different institution. So at Southeastern, it was um, that graphic, and I think this happens in a lot of institutions where we're graphic design. Um, it's not really clear, and especially there, it was a department of art, and graphic design is sort of a concentration. So um, I think the reason why when I got tenured the first time, um, well, not the first time, but when I got tenured initially, um, I shifted and I maybe focused on creative practices because I felt like that's what my the people who are going to be viewing my dossier would could relate to or understand. Just because you know they still don't seem to have, or they have a very limited understanding of the scope of graphic design, to be honest. Um, and so at at uh, NC State, um, the difficulty is first I don't teach design history. Um, at Southeastern, I was able to teach maybe design history a few times. And so I did use sort of the classroom as a way to kind of explore some of my ideas behind like, what are things that students are interested in exploring? You know, design history should be histories. So really sort of tapping into them and their interests and, and seeing what, um, what kind of things they want to learn about. I don't necessarily have I guess I have that freedom, but I don't have the classroom as a way to kind of explore that because somebody else is sort of in charge of that curriculum right now. So that's something I've been thinking about a lot. And the other thing I've been thinking about a lot is also now that I'm sort of in this sort of position where I've been doing, um, there are sort of these expectations about, you know, um, what I know about, you know, design history or my contribution to Black design history is the creative part. And because I still identify as a creative person and making. And so there's more and more people that are coming to me for these ideas behind, you know, Black design history. Hey, I want to learn more about it. And I'm like, I just want to design, you know? And so part of me is, it's still, do I have that, that, that sort of ongoing pursuit? Um, for that, um, I do start to wonder and think about like, well, what's my sort of research creative practice project now? Because I've gotten so sort of far into the history um, aspect. And although I don't have a PhD, I do feel like um, at NC State, they're okay with that. Um, they actually um, are sort of interested in like some of the work that I'm doing or I want to do there yeah, was sort of sort of like outreach programs and sort of reaching into the community and have them, you know, come to campus and, um, you know, like high school programs with getting students sort of um, exposed to graphic design who maybe don't have the resources at uh, some of the schools that they're at. So along the way around that question is, I think it's okay. I think people are being more open to the fact that like not everybody is going out there and get a PhD. And especially if we look around, you know, how many PhD programs are there in graphic design? I think we have two or three. Yeah. 
right now. So I think it's acceptable. We may have time, maybe for one last question here, which just came through um, from Gary. I have defined a research interest, but I feel a bit paralyzed by my own pressure to read and know everything about that subject before I dare to enter the conversation. I'm not alone in this feeling. How have we moved past that? I think imposter syndrome is real, and I have definitely been there, <laughs> Gary. Um, when I started writing my book, I first started out by listing a spreadsheet with all the books and articles that I had to read before I could start writing my book. And um, I started reading all those things and realized if I was going to commit to reading them all, I was not gonna write a book for five years, but my book was due in eight months. So I couldn't do that. Um, I think where I came to, to get over that, um, honestly, I've always found deadlines to be my best friend. So to know that I actually have to stop at some point um, and then I think more ideologically, knowing that um, like most of these, the topics that I'm really passionate about, I'm going to continue reading and writing about for a really long time. So I try to not put too much pressure on to read everything at this exact moment. Um, but as you saw from my pictures, like to pin up the, the like theoretical references that are really important for me. So I do a lot of reading and note taking. Um, I use Scrivener to do that. And I like Scrivener because I can like search my notes later. So I do a lot of like computational analysis on stuff that I'm doing too. So um, it's not a perfect answer, but it's just sort of how I've dealt with it recently. And we are at the end time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I guess, uh, I don't know if Casper or Tashika, if either one of you wanted to respond to that, we have maybe just a couple minutes left here before people may need to be taking off yeah. their own the rest of their days. Yeah. I can just say that um, I understand that because um, I, I, what I find helps me is sort of taking off smaller chunks or smaller themes within the context of whatever that big topic is you're researching. And so for me, that one makes it a little bit more sort of approachable where you don't feel like you have to be like the person, you know, to know everything there is to know about the particular topic. So just find like maybe a smaller aspect of it um, to kind of focus on. But I like what Liat said, Sometimes you can, if you look at it, it's like, it's not something that you're trying to solve in a year. You know, as you look at this research as something that's ongoing, then it seems less, um, I guess, um, heavy. My, I might also say to um, find a friend, meaning that um, because everybody will be pursuing very different ideas and topics, um, it may be worthwhile collaborating first with somebody else that has a deeper knowledge in that particular area um, so that you, you, you can contribute what you know and they can contribute what they know um, to use it as a, as a scaffold first, so. All right, thank you everyone. And a huge thank you to our panelists, Shika, Liat and Casper. I'm really inspired. My brain feels full. It's a good, it's a good end to my day. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to, a couple of reminders again, if any of you are interested in sharing your path and your story, even if it means to bring forth things that you're struggling with and looking for the community to help you with, with your path, please reach out to us. Again, please let us know of other people who are maybe on your radar or not on ours that we, we could bring forth. Um, and then I just, another reminder about, um, the mapping of research, which relates to this, which we're doing with AIGA DEC on November 12th. I just tried to find the link and I, I can't find it, but um, it, it was in their last newsletter. I don't know yeah. if it's on their website yet, but it's so, November 12th. November 12th at two central, three Eastern, I think. So we really wanna get a lot of collective voices into that and continue to grow it. And again, it's related to this, how we map research and scholarship. So just and what, we call, what we call design research and what is it? whatever it's called, <laughs> yes. whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everybody.